they walk in that room, they become yours. And you got this, this energy inside your soul that says, I am the number one determinant of the success or failure of my students. Hey, y'all, when you get back, kick some butt. I'll see you in the winner's circle celebrating your victory. Let's go, 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 let's go. Let's do this, let's do this, let's go, let's go. Thank you, everybody. And we are live. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to week 184 of the AP and New Principles Academy. Let me see who we got here in the building this morning. We got here checking in early, man. We had some early birds on here. We got Sharon Wright in the building. Mona. Abamolak, I hope I meet you one day and you could tell me if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Tanya Jackson, 13, is in the building. We got we got Grace Castaneda. Man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still grateful, Grace. Good to see you. Good to see you. We got Dr. Rachel Edo Eckett in the building. I'm going to be down in your neighborhood soon, Doc. Katrina Washington. Edgar Ray, Renee Graham is in the building. We got the Connecticut Assistant Principal of the Year. Arlette Johnson is in the building. John Few, uh, Takesha High, JDM894G. That sounds like some kind of agent or something, right? <laughs> we got Marsha Poe in the building all the way from San Diego. I'm glad to see you, Marsha, as always. There's my man. Principal Josh Tovar, let me tell y'all something, man. Josh took me to dinner, man. We went San Antonio last Sunday night. Was it Sunday, Josh? I think it was Sunday. We went to dinner to this Brazilian steakhouse. Man, I, I was sitting with my back to the people. He was facing the people. I turned around. <laughs> we, we were the only ones left in the restaurant, man. I'm like, man, I'm having some good conversation with my brother, Josh Tovar. Good to see you, my brother. John Herrix is in the building. Principal Otis Kitchen is in the building. Vanessa Zeskin, Lily Lanier, Tashika Truesdale. Y'all, I'm so tired, man, from flying yesterday. I could barely see this stuff, man. My, my sight is blurred. We got, we, got, we got Jacqueline Harriet in the building. Nova Scotia, man. You know, we broadcasted. For those of you who didn't see me live, we, we were live last week from Nova Scotia. Me and Dr. Chica Q... Uh, 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 Akua, Dr. Chika Akua, and um, Jacqueline is one of the the, the 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 ones who speared the conference, man. Two conferences I spoke at while I was um, on that Saturday, and then the, the Friday, the um, Nova Scotia Principal Association conference. And uh, but she she leads up the Black Educators Association, her and others, and um, in the Afrocentric conference, man. And we. What a time we had. What a time we had. I appreciate you, Jacqueline. I'm looking forward to next year. Nova Scotia, Canada, in the building. We got Doc A.T. Haynes in the building. Sandra, where we at? Mary Weathers in the building. Lysandra Brackens, my man, Lou Saunders, East Orange in the building. Doc McKeever Jeter, I'm glad you're doing so, so much better, Doc. Jocelyn Nelson, Principal Sean Hurt throwing down, man. One of the schools he works with was on the 7 o'clock news, man. Went from a B, no, from an F to a B. Let me say that again, y'all. <laughs> that school went from an F to a B in one year. Sean Hurt been working with that school. You better inbox that, brother. <laughs> we got Ar Ar Arcella Austri in the building. Jasmine Harris, man. I was looking for you. I met Jasmine finally. She's been a family member here for a long time, but I met her in person yesterday in, um, man, I'm, I'm having a mental block, Jasmine. Where was I yesterday? <laughs> I told you I'm tired. It's Sacramento, California, baby. I was in Sacramento, California yesterday at the Association of California Administrators Conference, man. I'll be back in California with a different region of the Association of California Administrators on this Wednesday. Y'all, pray for me, y'all. I got to speak from 5 to 7 
in, in, in Orange County with the principals, um, California on Wednesday, then catch a red eye and speak in North Carolina the next morning at eight o'clock. Pray for your brother. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get going, y'all. I see the queen. I see the queen is in the building. Kimberly Broughton Cafele. I need to twist her arm and make her come on that red eye with me, right? For on the one hand, just for support. On the other hand, so she can understand how I'm living. Because she don't get this all the way, man. She, she thinks she understand it. I need to get her on that red eye and then jump off the plane. Ain't no stop at the hotel for no shower. It's right to the spot. That's too much information. I know that. But it's right to the spot. Same suit. Same underwear. <laughs> and But I'm going to be bringing them flames. That's, that's the bottom line. Them people don't care about that. I'm bringing them flames. Enough said, y'all. I got to get started, man. I got the big time guest on, man. We, we ain't got time for all this. So let me say to y'all formally right now, good morning. Greetings. Welcome to week 184 of the AP and New Principles Academy. Listen here, y'all. I got to ask you that question that I ask you every Saturday morning. How y'all doing? How are you feeling? And I'm asking you that question because the world is real. There's so much that goes on. But your world in that school is real, too. Your world in that district is real, too. And if, you, if your response is, I'm not good, I'm not okay, I'm not where I want to be, that's okay. I hope that this platform plays just a little role, if not a bigger role, in just helping you to get back there. If I'm not feeling up to par on a Saturday, you're never going to know it unless I tell you, but I'm not going to demonstrate it. Because I because if there's somebody, because I'm not having the kind of weeks you had. Yeah, I got long weeks, but my week, my weeks are long because I'm sitting in an airplane all week, right? You in there trying to effectuate change, you trying to change lives. And I and I know the pressures that come with that. You know, central office, community, parents, the students themselves, teachers, all, staff, all that. I get it. But if 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 this platform could be just just a, a glimmer of hope. That's what it's about. So I'm going to keep it positive. I'm going to keep it a buck, as they say. I'm going to keep it 100. So I'm going to let you know real quick, my guests in the wings, I got to let you know that, I'm, and I'm being sincere with you right now, I'm on fire! Woo! I mean that, y'all. I am on fire. I'm feeling good. I'm tired. I'm probably going to take a nap today, but I'm still on fire. But I'm going to tell you specifically why. Because you're here with me. That's why. Jasmine Harris could tell you that. Because I said that yesterday. It's something about this academy, man. That keeps me, it just, just keeps the fire raging. Y'all hit that share button. Hit that retweet button. Let me, let me go through this rundown real quick. Uh, I shouted out Nova Scotia. Let me also shout out Texas ASCD. Last Sunday, man, we had a time, man. Good time. Wisconsin Counselors Association, 1,300 strong. Oh, man. We had, a, we had a good time, man. Dropping that information. Association of California School Administrators yesterday. Oh, man. We had a good time, man. That line, man. It was a line of folks, man. We just want to shake hands and get some pics in. I didn't bring, I don't bring books, you know. But some of them have books, man. But just, just the love, man. When, when, when you go somewhere, hear me, somebody that's maybe aspiring to speak. When you go places, and it's a line like a mile long, so to speak, and all they want to do is just say thank you. All they want to do is take a selfie shake your hand, give you a hug, or, or even pray for you, because I, I get that too. Life life don't get much better than that. Not on the professional side anyway, right? So shout out to all the folks out there. to Welcome uh, welcome to the first timers, man. But let me tell you something, first timers. If this is your first time, you have missed 183 weeks. But you can go to YouTube and watch them all. Right, go to AP and New Principles Academy. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button. We got 19,500 subscribers right now. I'm trying to get to 20,000. Right, then I'll have a new goal. Right, so hit that subscribe button. Second, um, be sure to like and follow the AP and New Principles Academy Facebook page. I write an essay every Saturday, Sunday morning. I didn't write one last Sunday because I was on the airplane, but um, and I I went to sleep. I could I just I couldn't do it, y'all. I'm human, right? But I'll have one tomorrow. 
right? So just like and follow the AP and New Principles Academy Facebook page. I'll have a commentary that will re be rooted in my conversation with Dr. Muhammad in a little while. Um, real quick, my joints. We got the AP, uh, the Assistant Principal 50. This is, the, this is the, the, the books for this academy anyway. The Assistant Principal Identity, Protecting Your Leadership Mindset, Fervor, and Authenticity. And the aspiring principal 50. These are the three that go with this academy. So if you don't have them yet, go to Amazon. Just get them now. Get it out the way, right? Get yourself a copy. And then uh lastly, let me let me let me let me give you my quick monologue to build up to my my comment, my conversation with Dr. Muhammad. My monologue is simply a question: what role does your leadership play toward cultivating genius in your classroom? What once again, what role does your leadership play? toward cultivating genius in your classrooms so here you are your leader your assistant principal your your principal or your we got aspiring principals on the call and i'm asking you like and i'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in depth with uh dr muhammad but i'm gonna say but i'm gonna say to you right now that when i think about this title of this book which i'm gonna put on the screen one of the biggest selling books in all of education on the planet earth i might add right cultivating genius when i first laid eyes on this title back in 2020 when it came out i thought about it i said she, she used the word cultivating genius so for me and, and we'll get into it when, I, when we have the conversation i'm gonna ask her for me the implicate what wasn't being what was being implied was the genius is there. It's already there. Like, like, like as teacher, you're not going in nowhere creating no genius. The genius is there. Your job, my, my interpretation from the title, and then when I read it, I said, okay, I was on point, is you're going to cultivate it. You're going to develop it. But at its core, at its essence, the genius, the youngster is walking in the room with genius the youngster came out the womb with genius so now i'm asking you as leader what role do you play to ensure that genius of each youngster in the building is being cultivated or are the youngsters in the building and the genius is being undermined the genius is being sabotage the genius is being stunted see if you're a leader and you chose to be leader whether that be assistant or principal it is your primary responsibility to ensure that genius is being cultivated on a daily basis that's my monologue today man i got the I got the big time guest, man. Let me, let me, let me, let me bring her on up here so y'all can meet her. Man, I got Dr. Goldie Muhammad in the building. Good morning, Dr. Muhammad. Good morning. How are you? I'm I know fire. you're doing good. I don't even know why I asked. <laughs> I'm on fire and I'm glad to see you. I'm on fire. No, I'm glad to see you too. And, you know, we need that kind of joy. Yeah. On, on each day, on a Saturday morning, but each day as we continue to navigate this work. You know, you, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, and I didn't even get to the bio yet, but I'm, I'm going to say this, and I don't mind saying this publicly. When I think about, when I think about the history of Black people in America, mm -hmm. I guess I put a lot of emphasis on oppression, mm -hmm. on struggle. Mm -hmm. And through reading your work, and you introduced for me the balance of joy like 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 i'm i'm out and i'm talking about the scientific contributions i'm 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 talking about the mathematical country i'm talking about the art the the the, the arts and all of, i'm talking about all that stuff but i'm not doing it with intentionality right i'm just doing it because i know it but mm -hmm. then here you introduce this balance of joy and i said i, I gotta rethink this because I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking about the contributions, the good that came out of struggle in the context of that word. And then here you come and, and follow up cultivating genius with unearthing it. Right. And that's I I, I you know, and 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 I guess I'm speaking for you. I don't think a better word could have could have preceded that word joy than unearthing joy. It just makes sense. Yeah. It just makes sense. 
let me let me share with the folks your bio and i should have asked you off camera because i'm gonna make the i'm gonna attempt to pronounce your your first name we all know you was goldie but let me let me try before you correct me uh, okay. go next sir go next sir uh very close it's Golnisar. oh i'm off Golnisar. all right I, I appreciate that too yeah, thank you so so dr Golnisar, goldie muhammad is an associate professor of literacy, language, and culture at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She has previously served as a classroom teacher, literacy specialist, school district administrator, curriculum director, and school board president. She studies black historical excellence in education, intending to reframe curriculum and instruction today. Dr. Muhammad's scholarship has appeared in leading academic journals and books. She has also received numerous national awards and is the author of the best-selling best -selling book, Cultivating Genius, an equity model for culturally and historically responsive literacy. She's also co-author of Black Girls Literacies, an edited volume. Her culturally and historically responsive educational model has been adopted across thousands of U.S. schools and districts across and across Canada. In 2022-23, she was named among the top 1% EduScholar public influencers due to her impact on policy and practice. She has also received numerous awards from national organizations and universities. She was named the American Educational Research Association Division K Early Career Award and the 2021 NCTE Outstanding Elementary Educator in the English Language Arts. She has led a federal grant with the United States Department of Education to study culturally, historically responsive literacy in STEM classrooms. Her forthcoming book, which is now her current book, Unearthing Joy, is the sequel to Cultivating Genius and provides a practical guide to putting culturally and historically responsive education into curricular practice powerful stuff y'all hit that share button hit that retweet button hit the repost let them know we are here we are live we are ready to go matter of fact hit, tag somebody hit them facebook principal groups let them all know we here hey doc and listen i was a principal for three weeks i feel like oh. we should say that too oh. <laughs> yeah not most definitely it didn't last long you know principals i don't know if you know this but they have very difficult jobs <laughs> I'm just kidding, but they do. We know that. But, but since you brought it up, and this is a principal audience, I know you, you got to tell us, man, what happened. <laughs> no, you know, like when the principal was out or something, I don't know what happened, but I, I did some rotations where I was interim, and it was on all the time, all kind of. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't yeah. have to tell this audience that, yeah. and I was like, whoo. Yeah. This is a lot. Um, and, you know, I said, well, I think, you know, you have to know, you have to be in places and you have to be in roles and responsibilities where joy flows throughout your body and you feel in it. And I, it gave me such an appreciation of principles. But I just really, I realized I just really wanted to solely or mostly focus on curriculum and instruction. Yeah. So uh, I, I thought my first book would be called The Power of Quitting <laughs> because I ended up taking a different administrator's role. But, you know, it, it was a great experience because you have to, you have to sort of wear the shoes a little bit to understand and appreciate because so many times, you know, principals and leaders are un underappreciated. Mm -hmm. We talk about joy a little bit. Nobody really focuses on the joy of principals, but they deserve joy too. So that was a very difficult job for me, but it gave me empathy and appreciation. There it is. There it yeah. is. It's, it's, it's tough work, but as many of us say, it's hard work. Yes. Uh, Matt, Dr. 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 Wish she had, wish she had, Dr. Rosa Perez. She just said something. She said it was, I can't find it, but she said it's the, oh, here it is. She said it's the hardest, the hardest job I've ever loved. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. And that's it, man. This It's, it's yeah. the hardest job I've ever loved. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, with everything I said, I read in your bio, let me, let me go beyond that. As an educator, who is Dr. Goldie Muhammad? Mm. You know, I when I meet people and like when I talk about the work, I I want them to feel a sense of kinship to me as I want them to see me as their sister, their friend, their partner in this work. 
I, I don't want uh, hierarchies. I just want us to feel that we are in this transformational work together. So that's the first thing that I, I try to, to uh, leave when people are in conversation with me. I try to make them feel joy, to feel love, to feel listened to and appreciated. Um, I like to be the kind of leader who not only writes about the work, but lives the work. Um, and, and part of my own you know, purpose as, a, as someone who's leading uh, teachers and leaders throughout the nation is I, I like to be the work in terms of if I'm talking about teaching, I have to teach. I have to teach children. Now, my role and my job now as a professor is different. I can, I'm not in the classroom. I'm not in the schools every day. But I intentionally find times to go into somebody's class <laughs> to teach during the school year. In the summers, I run writing programs and institutes. So I try to, as much as possible, live out curriculum that I'm writing and, 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 and understand, even if it's on a smaller scale, what teachers experience when they're writing and then when they're teaching it. Um, if, I, if I complain about something in the system, and there's certainly lots to complain about in the system, um, I, I like to be the one or one of the ones to rewrite it, to rethink it. Mm. So, you know, a great example of that are the standards, are the curriculum, are the evaluations. Yeah. Then when I find that they're problematic, I spend time reworking them for myself. I have to do that work and so I can see what they can become. So I'm always in the, the practice of, of, you know, yes, researching, writing, but also rewriting and implementing the stuff that I'm talking about. And, you know, this idea of joy, everything I try to write, I, pr I try to practice it, <laughs> every single thing. And you know, and that's important because sometimes you meet people and they write these things about equity and justice and they be treating people raggedy yeah. in real life. You know, they I, I've met people to write about black children and black people and the way they treat black women is horrendous. Mm. And I'm like, mm, OK, I see what you're about, you know. So, yeah, those are the things that I kind of try to keep in mind as I move about the world. I'm finding myself, as you said, that last comment about folks are writing th certain things about black folks and then you see them, they're different. I'm sitting here biting my tongue on a whole lot of things that I want to say as a, in response to what you just said. And I said, let me, let me, my wife might say, leave it alone. Right. So let me just, <laughs> let me just keep going for I say something that I might regret later, but I, I'm, but I'll say this, much. I'm with you because I, I'm, I'm yeah. with you. and that's why, you know, I, that's why I'm the that's why I'm I'm the person I am today. That's I, I guess that's how I can sum it up. I'm very much conscious of that. Um yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, Doc, it, I think it is widely known with people that know your work, and there's countless people that know your work mm -hmm. that a lot of what you do around literacy is 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 influenced by your study and research of 19th century black literary societies. And, and the correlation between that work and what could be done in classrooms today. So, so my question to you, how did you even discover 19th century li black literary societies? How, how, did, how did you stumble on that? How did you come across that? And, and what is the correlation between the work that they did back then and what we could do now? Yeah, so I in graduate school when I was getting my PhD at UIC, which is the same institution I'm now working at, um, I was really interested in literacy groups and writing clubs and things like this. Um, my, my dissertation research was on Black girls and how they write across their identities. And I compared the historical writings of Black women to how Black girls write today. And so there was this class my advisor, Alfred Tatum, was offering. And I was at the end of my program. I'm like, 
Lord, I do not want to take another class. Mm -hmm. And, but you know, it's your advisor. He expected me to be enrolled, I think, <laughs> even though I had all fulfilled my requirements. And so I, I tried to talk all the other potential students out of taking the class. I said, you know what? If I can talk them out of it on the low, I would the class wouldn't make. <laughs> I don't think he, uh, he knows this story. So I talked to Joe, I talked to all kinds of people who were taking the class and we did not have enough students to make the class. And uh, Dr. Tatum said, I'm gonna teach it anyway. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, well that didn't work. But the class was so beautiful. You know, this is a lesson to us all. When you try to interrupt and disrupt something, what will be for you will be anyway. And so this class was about the historical literacy development of black males. That was the name of the class. And in this class, we each had to take the topics we were interested in and historicize them or, or you know, study the history of them. And because I was interested in these book clubs and these writing groups, I came upon, you know, black history, American history of these literary societies, these literary institutions where black people would gather to read, write and think and debate and, and build their libraries. And I mean, it was so beautiful. It was I was so entrenched in the archives and the historical artifacts that I almost found myself, you know, talking back and forth to the ancestors and they were leading me to something else, to something else, to something else. And it was, um, it was such a um, holistic kind of embodied, uh, joyful experience for me doing this research. Uh, I would often write poetry during it. I, I, my creative sensibilities will come out as I'm reading what the ancestors were speaking into me. Um, so it was a time period of my life that I felt whole. I felt uh, like everything I had felt in my mind, body, and spirit when it comes to teaching and education. I was like, yes, here it is. And we have the, the, the archival proof. And as I was reading, it was the ancestors were helping me to become a better teacher, leader, teacher, educator. I learned that what they read, I, I said, this is what our children need to read, the genres, the kinds of texts, their practices in education, their goals for education, I said, this needs to be the goals for education for uh, children today. And so that's how I end up with these five pursuits, because I, I started to code the archival voices of the ancestors and say, wow, they're speaking to their identity here. They're speaking to their consciousness or criticality here. They're speaking to their joy, their knowledge, their intellect here. And, and so the model became, it was built, even though I called uh, some of the pursuits that we know today in my books, I called them different things back then because that's what researchers do. We code, we recode, we try to understand what makes the most sense. But when you ask about the correlation today, there's so much. I mean, even how they organize in their classroom kind of learning spaces, it wasn't ability groups like we see today, we see tracking, we see ability groups, but it was like, no, I'm going to be, I'm going to be sitting next to someone learning from someone who may know more than me. And it's an each one teach one philosophy. It was about collectivism, not individualism or competition, mm -hmm. right? It was about reading across texts, global literatures, black literatures, reading things to, to have critical perspective and debate. Even when you checked out a book from a library of a literary society, you were expected to deliver a short speech on it because the brother or sister next to you may want it, may want to check out that book or read that book, but it was every opportunity, it was a way to educate each other. And that was a beautiful something within itself. They critiqued each other. They, they prepared 
It was like they would read something, understand it, communicate it. Then they would write about it, give a public address on it. So they would take a topic and elevate it in all forms of literacies. And they studied math and science and language and art and fashion. They had all these sort of interesting topics and they had a focus on their youth. But the highest correlation from or you know, connection of taking this historical genius to say what we need to do today yes. is that they have five pursuits for learning. As they were as they were engaged in education, they were making sense of their identity. They were elevating skills, intellectualism, criticality, and joy. That is the biggest takeaway. And what I help educators to do is take those five manifestations, those those five pursuits. Yeah. And, 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 and act it in classrooms today and take those other elements of what they would do in terms of practices and community and create the classroom environment for children today. Wow. You know, um, let, me, let, me, let me holler at the fam real quick. Okay. Um, as, I, as I sat here listening, and you notice I'm not putting a lot of comments on the screen because I'm, I'm really sitting here processing as opposed to reading comments and listening to my guest. And I'm, I'm, I, I literally put myself in the classroom space, fam. And most of you out there, you know my story. So you know what kind of student I was coming up. But I'm thinking about what I'm hearing and I'm saying, that would have been a game changer for me. So I'm saying to you all out there, as you listened, and as you process, and obviously that's just a summary because we, you know, we just we're just a live stream on a Saturday morning. But can that does that what you just heard happen under your leadership? Right? Does it happen under your watch? Who are you in relationship to the teachers that you supervise? Which you know is my question. What is my value to the teachers that I supervise instructionally? Right. So I just want you to process that and keep the mirror handy. <laughs> as you self-reflect, right? Self-assess. Yes. You know, Doc, you are um, assistant professor and your, your areas of focus are, are literacy, language, and culture. And I, I wanted to I wanted to take a look at each of these, all three of them. And, and I had specific scenarios I wanted to give you. And, and the first one, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about as a principal, and you talked about how, how challenging that role can be. I was a numbers cruncher, but I wasn't a numbers cruncher because I was trained to become one. It just seemed instinctively I, I needed to have a have a handle on numbers. Mm -hmm. So in, in being a numbers cruncher, I, I, I knew the numbers, you know, the data in my school. I knew the data of the district, but I also kept up with New Jersey and the rest of the country. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I found going back to my first day as a teacher in Brooklyn, New York City in 1988 mm -hmm. was black children. We're on the wrong side of this, as I call so-called achievement gap, right? And I always, I got to yes. preface it with that so-called achievement gap because it goes back to your title, cultivating genius. The genius is there, right? So then throughout the years, I'm just looking at data, looking at data. And here I am 35 years from the day I walked into a classroom mm -hmm. and that gap still exists. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, if, if we narrow it to standardized assessments, which I don't do, but just for the sake of discussion here, then it's then I would call it a state of emergency. So, so my question to you is, where are we getting it wrong as it relates to literacy relative to Black children? Yeah, that's a great question. So first we have to understand, and I wanna make this quite clear, the system is designed for an achievement gap. We should not even expect in some ways the gap to close because the system is designed for the gap to remain open. It is fixed in that way. That's what Pharrell Williams shared with me. He says, the system isn't broken, it's fixed. Right. Now, it's the same thing of saying that if I lent you money and you have not paid me back in year two year three you are intentionally not paying me back you're choosing not you can pay me back because you got the money but you don't now that gap is not going to close right. 
And if there is interest, even though in Islam, interest is illegal, but if there is interest, the gap will widen. The system is much of the same way. We and to expect it to close when you know that you have no intentions on paying it back. Mm -hmm. The system in education, the U.S. education has never given educational reparations to black and brown children. And so without those reparations, without the system, uh, that's where we're getting it wrong. That's why our children, according to these tests, are not performing as they should to their highest potential. And in my work, I specifically talk about five core areas of where we are, where we're not, where it's not working. And to answer your question, like where we're getting it wrong with. The first thing that hasn't changed uh, since the 1600s is pretty much the standards. We don't have culturally responsive standards. We have skills-based standards. And, and even when you study standards, I study standards across states. They're very Eurocentric. I mean, look at Georgia's social studies standards. Students have to identify folks like Columbus, Christmas. It's very white. Mm -hmm. It is very, uh, it, it neglects women and people of color. The second thing that has remained unchanged where we've never had reparations on is curriculum. I cannot say enough that curriculum is the heart and soul of the school. So if the curriculum is problematic, of course, the achievement is going to not meet, be where it should be. I do a lot of curriculum audits. I, I do a lot of, I talk to a lot of textbook companies and the type of curriculum uh, they are putting out, they should be ashamed to, to, to put their name on it. Yeah. They should be ashamed. Yeah. These curriculum programs are skills only. They are not designed to address and elevate identity, consciousness, joy, intellect even, especially with mathematics curriculum. The same kind of design of curriculum that we have seen in the 1600s with our nation's first public school we see today in 2023. The third area of where we're getting it wrong, and, and you know, back to curriculum for a second, I could talk about curriculum all day and night, mm -hmm. but see when schools adopt new textbooks, they are, it's like when you have three cable companies to pick from and they all feel raggedy, but you got to pick one to spend the money. That's how schools feel. Yeah. They, they just, they receive whatever curriculum that publishing company puts in front of them. They don't get a chance to co-design it with them. The curriculum companies do not come to Chicago or places and say, let me talk to the elders of the community. Let me talk to the people. Let me talk to the children and design something special for you and your history. I, mean, I have been working with Detroit and we are writing Detroit localized curriculum wow. because their curriculum company didn't make it Detroit. How are you going to make it Detroit? And you're writing for Detroit. Yeah. The third is assessment. We, uh, like you, a data, we as leaders, we have see a lot of data. And I started seeing in 2022 last year with our nation's report card, 15% of Black children in fourth grade are proficient in math. 17% of Black fourth graders are proficient in reading. I said, we failed 83 to 85% of someone's child and no one is in outrage. See, nobody presents the data like that at a school level. We are failing 85% of our Black fourth graders. That's how the data should be represented. Not as 15% are proficient in math. <laughs> right. No, we are only through our system and curriculum only responding to 15%. So when we, uh, our assessments are sometimes biased and skewed, but we don't assess identity development. We don't assess joy, consciousness. The fourth area is teacher evaluation mm. because teachers are not evaluated on anything but skills and and not on their ability to help a child to know themselves on, on their ability to impart joy mm. on their ability to impart justice and consciousness you know we'll have some teachers do this work and some teachers who simply won't because they're not evaluated on it a lot of people will follow what they're hired to do or they'll follow that evaluation and a lot of principals they'll say but you also have to do this well why isn't this on the evaluation 
Most people use the Charlotte Danielson model for evaluation. Charlotte Danielson and that team did not design it for anti-Black racism, for criticality. And here we are using it in our school districts that are highly Black and Brown. I don't understand it. And the last area is more like teacher education, uh, programs, universities, professional development. We are still not really talking about courses on joy, on the self. How do I unpack who I am to teach better? Uh, we don't have courses on identity development. I mean, it's getting better, right? Back in the day, it was one diversity class. And we don't see that largely anymore. However, when the, those five areas, when they have relatively remained unchanged since the 17th century, <laughs> you should, that's what I mean, why you should expect an achievement gap. Why don't we have culturally and historically responsive curriculum? Why do teachers have to rewrite the curriculum? And they don't have the time with one planning hour. Why don't we have better curriculum, better standards, better evaluations, better assessments? See, we know why. Because if we keep the system the same yeah. and we allow people to continue to profit off of capitalism and not humanity, I mean, we don't have humanity, we have capitalism. When we know that assessments is a multi-million, maybe billion dollar industry, people want to keep it the same. They want to keep failure. They want some people to graduate and get certain jobs and some people to don't. So it is a design fix system. And so the best thing we can do is galvanize and advocate. I even said, have we ever, you know, we at UIC, we went on strike. As a teacher, we went on strike for wages and support, yes. But can we add on there that as teachers, we are striking for better assessment, <laughs> better pedagogy, better curriculum, better standards. We can add that to the list, but it doesn't happen. We don't see it. So it has to be some kind of move because what people are doing right now is trying to erase Black children's lives and history and liberation. We see it happening. And the reason why many of us growing up did not learn about Black literary societies, because there were books and guides and, and, and funded efforts to say, do not teach Black genius in our K-12 schools, only teach them as oppressed as struggling, as slaves, as they would say. They were happy on the slave, on the plantation. Some people wrote back then. See, that's the narrative they want to tell. They don't want to tell the story of Black joy, Black genius, Black magic, how we are magical and beautiful. You said a lot there. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at these comments slightly. While I'm listening, they saying, you know, they, they saying everything. You got the church in here, you know. You got, you got, you got everybody in here. Just amen in you. Okay. You know, let's, let's, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna deviate. You said you got a little time, right? So let me, let me, let me deviate from my, my sequence here, um, and and speak to what you just spoke to. For me, going back to my first day on the job, 1988, mm. and, I, and I will take this to my grave. For me, the fundamental question for black children to be able to answer, that they must be able to answer, is who am I? Mm. Identity rests at my core mm. as an educator. My fourth year of teaching, Doc, the, 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 soup, the principal saw fit to name me as the teacher of the year. The superintendent called and said you're the district teacher of the year the county exec the county superintendent said you're the county teacher of the year this was all in jersey okay. and then i was new jersey state finalist teacher of the year my fourth year of teaching elementary fifth graders mm -hmm. and the question was 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 asked widely how is this so right he's a baby in education and the answer is very simple the answer is because what we were doing was radically different from what most were doing where Folks are trying to raise achievement levels, and I'm trying to introduce children to who that is in their own mirrors. Yeah. 
culturally speaking. And as they came into that understanding, interdisciplinary math, science, language, arts, social studies, achievement soared. Because in my in my mind, transform the attitude via the history and culture, and the and the achievement will take care of itself. Because you said it, they're genius. I just got to cultivate it, but they're coming in with it. Yeah. But I got young people who may not necessarily realize what they got inside. Yeah. So, so, so with that, and I, and I, and I want to share this piece with you if I can grab it real quick. Now I don't feel like doing that. Okay. <laughs> it's just too much to grab. And, and okay. But Malefi Asante wrote Liber Journey to Liberation, Dr. Malefi Asante, a, a text for the young people. And I go to the superintendent, my first principalship, and say, let me let me make this school culturally relevant. Let me lead the effort. So we went on and did it. We used his text, Journey to Liberation, a study of African-American history and, and now Valley Contributions to Civilization by to Dr. Tony Browder. And we transformed an inner city school in East Orange and made it one of the highest performing schools in the state of New Jersey, urban, right? And it goes back to everything you said about identity. It yeah. matters. It yeah. matters. Yeah. To the fam out there, identity matters. It, it matters. You can't run from it. Yeah. Let me, let, let me get back to my sequence because I'm curious about this, this question I got up next. Um, here's a scenario, Doc. There's there's two children, two third graders um, going into third grade, live in the same neighborhood, okay. same zip code. They go into a school, same school, but two different teachers. Child A, we're going to say, has a, a teacher with an elementary certification. Child B has a teacher with an elementary certification, but a specialization in, in teaching, reading, and a, and a particular focus in language development, right? And, I'm, and I'm, I'm using that because of those three areas that we talked about in terms of what you teach. So therefore, the probability, depending on who that, that teacher is beyond skill, the probability is that that youngster in that classroom with that teacher with those added credentials is going to achieve at a higher level than the one who's who doesn't have the credentials that the teacher has. Mm -hmm. My question to you is a leadership question. Okay. What is it that the folks, the fam who are watching right now can do when a youngster is in a classroom on the essentially the luck of the draw I'm with this teacher versus this teacher just on luck, which can have lifelong implications? What can a leader do to ensure that language development is universal, that yeah. everybody has an optimal opportunity to uh, be successful in class? Yeah. So, you know, being someone who always studied literacy language and language, I mean, I have degrees in it. And I, I said, I remember I was interviewed at Georgia State and they said, you know, what's your dream school, your middle, um, a dream middle school. And I said, every, every teacher would have a literacy degree. <laughs> that was a part of my dream. Wow. Wow. Because to get to mathematics, you need literacy. Yeah. You get to science, PE, the arts, it's all literacy. And that's what it was for black people. We didn't have literacy over here and math over here. Literacy was the foundation. Literacy was synonymous with education for black people. Uh, historically. And so I, I I can understand why in this scenario of classroom A and B, where the teacher who's extra uh, prepared in literacy and language might uh, elevate that child's um, achievement in all areas because of it. So as a leader, if you're seeing this, there's, 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 there's two ways to get knowledge. Yes, you can take those three to four course endorsements in universities and pay for it. But what leaders can do is bring that same endorsement they would have got in a teacher ed program at a university, bring it into professional development. We don't need universities to give us everything. As a leader, you can partner with the local professor of literacy and say, you know what? Can we do a, a visiting researcher position? Hmm. New York City Department of Education asked me to do that years ago. And I, I actually gave them the idea. I, uh, not for myself, but just to say, 
why don't you all, instead of bringing all the consultants in, you know you can just hire someone on a short time basis, pay them out of their contract at the university and do a visiting scholar and train and give people and let them collect data because why is teacher B and they're reading, uh, they're reading and language certification, why are they doing so much better? And how can we capture the practices, the pedagogy that they're doing in classroom B and make sure classroom A and other teachers have it? Yeah. So my point is we have to create professional learning opportunities to make sure this is not an uh, outlier, <laughs> that this just doesn't happen, that yeah. we are at each one teach one, a, sh a shared collective space learning from black folks. And then whatever we're doing here, we model here. Give that teacher a substitute for a day and allow teacher B to go into teacher A's class to model the instruction, to co-create with them, but support teacher B because that's more labor and more work, mm -hmm. right? So we need to be, again, take and learn from black ancestors of how we can all be better. Those are easy and rich examples that will make sure that students are in who are in classroom A are not just left out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Studying, studying history. Is 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 all in the history, but if if we're not being exposed to it, if it's being if it's being sabotaged, if it's being denied, then we don't have access to it, and then we got to look at other ways that we're going to gain this information. Sure, yeah, great stuff. The other area of focus for you is culture, and um, culture has you know as 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 everybody knows many tentacles, and you know we can talk about classroom culture, school culture, cultural relevance, cultural responsiveness, cultural culture of excellence, literacy, high expectations, etc. But I want to look at culturally relevant pedagogy. Dot um, in in a literacy environment in a classroom, and in 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 and I just want you to consider the folks that tune into this platform, right? Um, when you think about a literacy environment. And we're talking about a classroom that is culturally that, that where a teacher is culturally relevant relative to pedagogy. What does that look like? A culturally relevant classroom as it relates to literacy when implemented correctly. So we have to first understand uh, culturally relevancy, you like when that term was coined by the amazing um, Dr. Gloria Lassing Billings, she, we have to understand the extent of her work. Right. And, you know, in short, I mean, it's hard to take genius and put it into a few words, but she says that culturally relevancy is when we see evidence in the teaching learning assessment and environment of uh, academic success. Their, their skills, their knowledge, their strategies being taught. The second thing she says is when we see cultural competence, we see teachers and leaders helping children to learn who they are, whose they are, their own culture, their own race and other forms of identities, but also the identities and cultures of people who may be different than them. And the third thing she captured was social political consciousness. When we explicitly, not you gotta dig and go this and that, it is explicitly there where we are uh, teaching, learning and assessing uh, consciousness, equity, anti-oppression, problem solving. So now you're using your, your reading and writing and math skills to look at a social problem to solve application. Yeah. See, the problem is we have one of those three in our assessments, curriculum, <laughs> um, standards, all those five areas I named earlier, we have academic success. And some of the academic success is low level. It's not even rigorous academic success. And some schools who do really well with test scores, they're like, we're fine. I say, no, you're not. If you are doing high in, in academics in terms of traditional skill development, below in identity development or consciousness, you just, okay, yeah. okay. I don't know what you say, the state gave you this rating, right. but you right. are, you're on your way, but don't yeah. think you do this and that. So um, when we see a culturally relevant classroom, we will explicitly see those three areas in the five areas. 
in the five, those three components of Dr. Lasting Billings in those five areas I mentioned. Now, in terms of responsiveness, you know, like when Geneva Gay and so many others put out that work, they're saying, okay, well, how, how is your curriculum and instruction responding to who students are, but the social times around them too? Like you cannot have a whole war in Palestine and, and, and children and people being killed senselessly just for being uh, who they are and for money, you know, and all these things. And, and you cannot see black brothers and sisters being shot and killed you know, and police brutality and all this thing, like that doesn't come up in your classroom and in your instruction. You know, you can see climate change, that doesn't come up. So whatever we're seeing in the social times, our pedagogy is, is, is on point and reflective. Now, when my work came in, I said, well, if we add historically to it, we're being more intentional about a model that the black ancestors gave us that can be useful for all children who are struggling, who are uh, academically succeeding, you know, how, what can be a model for children with IEPs um, across the board? And so my model brings in five learning goals. So as a leader, if you, if you wanna know if you see culturally and historically responsiveness, still honoring uh, Dr. Latson's Billings work, you will see five areas. You will see identity being explicitly taught, assessed in the classroom. You will see skills being explicitly taught and assessed in the classroom. You will see intellect and knowledge being taught and assessed. And you will see criticality, which is teaching about justice. That's the social politically conscious piece. And you will see joy. It, it won't, it, you will see joy being taught, measured and, and assessed. And so if you see those five things in the teaching and learning, in the environment, in the unit plan, in the lesson plan, in the read aloud, that's how you know that the teacher is uplifting culturally relevant and responsive work. Yeah. You know, you said something that resonated with me as far as um, GLB, Lori Letts and Billings, <laughs> when, you said, when we hear the notorious GLB. Yeah, the notorious GLB. <laughs> He was on here about a year ago, but um, when you said honor her work, see that that language culturally relevant pedagogy, people have run with it. You know, they 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 use the language, but they're not necessarily always rooted in her research. And 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 when you say honor her work, that takes it full circle. That that, that you got to that you got to study her. You got to study what it is that she put out there before you start using that language and call yourself implementing culturally responsive or culturally relevant i should say pedagogy yeah, yeah good great stuff let's let's keep moving yeah. um and listen all the other black women too you know donna ford joyce king cynthia diller i mean we have to honor the black women who who name this work who have been doing this work there yeah. would be no unearthing joy or cultivating genius without the sisters and black women before me i just need to say that out loud no, you are. I, I love it. You know, Donna Ford was on here about less than a year ago. And I mean, she was it was a powerful conversation, you know, but, uh, you know, I want to I want to go here. OK. Cultivating genius. And I, I want to reiterate um, what I said earlier in, in my my monologue that it's my belief. It's my it's 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 my firm belief that the children I don't I don't care what the cir circumstances may be at home, what they may be in the neighborhood, what they were born into, they're bringing genius with them. Yeah. Right. But 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 the bottom line is, are we equipped to unleash it to to bring it out, or is it going to remain dormant for the rest of their lives or until circumstances bring it? So, what I'm what I want to ask you first is. Am, 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 am I saying the right thing in terms of why you entitled the book Cultivating Genius? What, 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 what is the message that you're conveying through that title? The message is that we come from genius. We don't come from oh, what oppressors did to us. Our stories don't start there. We don't come from struggling. We don't come from low achievement. I started, you know, this model, I've been using this model for 14 years. People know it just from the last three years. Yeah, right. I've been doing this work 
in terms of the model itself for 14 years. And I would travel around and talk to teachers and, I, and they would bring me in to help educate them on how to teach literacy and education to their black and brown children. And I would say, well, tell me about your black children. I, if you want me to help you, tell me who they are. And they said, they're struggling, they're at risk. And I said, no, tell me about your black children. And they would say they're confrontational. They defi they're defiant. They hate to read and write. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm sorry. I think you have misunderstood my question. Tell me about your black children. And again and again, and I was being very purposeful in my, uh, my <laughs> questions again and again, because I never heard genius. Yeah. And, and you're not going to do that to us. You're not going to speak about us like that. And I noticed that in, in talking about their own sons and daughters, oh yeah, my child is doing good on the baseball team and they're, they're mm -hmm. joyful and they're happy and they're painting and uh, -uh you're not going to find something genius to say about your own child. Mm -hmm. But when I ask about other people's children, Lisa Dell Pitt told us, you're not about to do that. So I noticed that when it came to black children, we called them subgroup and unmotivated and, and non-white and all these stuff is the things that never started with genius. I am saying that every child carries genius in them. They already have it. We don't give it to them. Much like we don't give a flower its beauty. If you grow it, if you cultivate it, if you give it the right sunlight, water and soil, you have to believe that that seed will grow into something beautiful. Yeah. That's what a flower is and does. A nature of a flower is to bloom. The nature of children is to is to bloom. That's right. And 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 it, we have to believe, and we have to do the work. So that's why cultivating is a verb. You have to do the work to make the child. You have to cultivate what's already there. If you don't believe genius is already there, if you don't believe the flower will grow. Of course, it's not going to grow. Yeah. If you think a child is struggling, your lesson plan will be struggling. Yeah. If you think a child is genius psychologically, your lesson plan will be genius because you're going to respond to who they are. Yeah. And so our beliefs about children really matter. I'm not the first to say that and I won't be the last. Yeah. You know, so that is what it starts from. And we come from genius. Black people have been leading <laughs> in innovation, music, arts, literacy, literature, poetry, uh, debate, intellectual. I mean, you name it. Yeah. Black folks have been a beautiful model to listen and learn from. Yeah. And, and when I say that, they're like, they got problems with it. Like, oh, it must just be for black children. I said, yeah. Well, nobody said Vygotsky and John Dewey is just for, or Lucy Calkins is just for white children. Right. Oh, their model was okay for black children, but this model of excellence is not okay for white children or it's only for black children. So listen, you all, my point is, is that our children, every single child, Asa Hilliard said this, every single child is just genius. Yeah. You have to, your goal as a leader and a teacher is to find it, recognize it, honor it, and to bring it out and only elevate what's already there. That is our only job. Your job is not to question their parents' choices on their names. Your job is not to just complain about them when they don't read on level. Your job is to cultivate and create space for genius, justice, and joy, period. And if Woo. you know how to do that, then ask me. This is why, or ask, other people who are doing it well, and we will help you. There's nothing more beautiful than knowing what to do and having the help for it. I love it. Dr. Ford said you nailing it. Yeah, you know, you, you said it, find, find it, recognize it, honor it. Hey fam, I gotta holler at you. Listen, as you, as you, as you coach your staff, as you're coaching teachers, and you look at what's happening in that classroom. Is that genius being found? Is it being recognized? But most importantly, is it being honored? Mm -hmm. It matters. Hold up that mirror. Yeah. And look disrupt the language. It. Yeah. List of terms that we're not going to say in our school. I do that all the time with my students. We are not going to say these words about children. That's it. 
Day one. Not permitted. Not permitted here. Right. You know, and, and then it becomes a part of the culture. We just we just don't do this. There's no punishment. We just don't do it because the culture won't allow it. Yeah. You know, as, as a subtitle, another thing that caught my attention when I first got this book, when I first knew this book was around, an equity framework for culturally and historically responsive literacy. Here's what I, here's what I want to ask you. We talk about culturally responsive this and that all the time. But what we don't talk a lot about is historically responsive, right? And 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 I found that I probably talk more historically than I do culturally, just because of my love of history. So I want to I want to ask you this: historically responsive literacy. What does that look like? What do you What do you mean when you say that? Yeah. So first, we have to understand that culturally relevant or responsive education within itself is historically grounded, right? Everybody who wrote, who are writing about CRE are also understanding and writing about history. Mm -hmm. I, I did not want to give educators another acronym. We have so many, but the reason why I added the word historically, because I was being more intentional about this part of Black history, that I say, that why not use Black people, Black education as a model to educate all children? I studied years ago in South Africa, and I was in my university class, and it was an Indian Muslim brother, you know, who came into the class, and he says, you know what? He spoke really softly and slowly in a very profound way. He says, if this world is going to interrupt war, capitalism, pain, oppression, the one group of people we need to listen to and learn from are the African-Americans, he says. He said, Tell me more. What do you mean? He says, there's no one on earth who has been through what you all have as a history, the chattel slavery, the joy, the innovation, the models. Most people take Black people's model for social movements. No one had a more advanced state of education in terms of a model for education than Black people. Nobody looked out for other people who were suffering than Black people, he says. And there's a lot of diversity in Black folks. Yeah. You can be half white and be Black. You can speak only Spanish and be Black. So he was explaining this. So this notion of historically responsive, uh, that's where the historically part comes from. Now, the historically responsive literacy, I found that literacy was defined as education. Literacy was defined as not just skill development. You look at the science of reading and most folks who are, who are doing balanced literacy, whole literacy, uh, uh, reading, writing project, all they're doing is talking about skill development as literacy, literacy as skills. Mm -hmm. But what Black folks, how Black folks define literacy historically, literacy was identity development. As you are reading and writing, you need to set goals explicitly to help children to know who they are. Going back to your notion of that mirror, you have to teach about the cultural lives of diverse people. And then they said, yes, skills matter, but in the context of knowledge, what is the point of teaching children how to read fluently if they don't become smarter about anything they're reading about? So they said literacy is intellectualism. The difference between knowledge and intellect, knowledge stays in your mind, intellect, you do something with it. Mm. And then the ancestor said, literacy is criticality. You don't get to literacy without anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-oppression. you know, anti -oppression. And we know today we have multiple forms of anti-oppression we need to address in the class. So how can you be reading and writing and, and develop a sense of consciousness of criticality. And then the last one was joy. Nobody in all the reading literature, I'm a former reading specialist, in all of the reading literature, nobody said, you know what, let's measure and elevate joy in reading. Reading is joy. I mean, we said reading is joy, but at the end of the day, when you look at those reading programs, no explicit teaching, measurement, assessment on joy. But for the ancestors, reading literacy was joy. And joy and justice had a powerful relationship. You, you did not get to joy without justice. 
The ancestors were fighting for anti-slavery, anti-racism, anti-sexism. You know what? They were really fighting for joy. Nobody wants to wake up and fight every day. They were fighting for a sense of peace and wellness and belonging. That's what joy offers. That's what joy is. Joy gives us energy. Joy is the rest. That's what they were fighting for. So the reason why, again, I call it historically responsive literacies, because we are responding to the same pursuits our ancestors have and literacy being defined in these five ways. So I'm, 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 I'm an administrator. I'm a school leader watching this morning. I'm, I'm here live or I'll see the video later on. And I'm, I'm, I'm fired up about listening to Dr. Goldie Muhammad and everything that she's saying about literacy, particularly around historical, historically um, uh, re relevant literacy and, and culturally relevant literacy. So with me being that brand new administrator and I'm fired up watching the platform this morning, my question to you as speaking for that person who's probably out there thinking this, hey, Doc, where do I start? Because my school is generic in its literacy approach. It's a one size fits all for everybody. Yeah. Um, as my my best friend, Dr. Sometimes I want to call her the Honorable Yolanda Seeley Ruiz. Um, my better half, as I say, as she tells us where to start, start with self. Mm. You have to start with who you are, who you are, what is your genius. You cannot lead for genius if you do not understand the genius you carry. You cannot lead for identity if you do not know who you are. You cannot help a child understand skills if you don't understand how to teach skills yourself. Mm. When's the last time you've been in that classroom teaching a culturally and historically? Try it out, a lesson plan. A read aloud. You cannot understand intellect if you do not practice the art and science of, of gaining intellect in your life. If you don't read, you cannot lead. And you cannot teach for and lead for criticality if you have no consciousness, mm. if you sleep in, right? Sure. And then joy. How can you lead for joy? And every day when people leave you, they don't feel joy. So it starts with doing some self-reflection and some practice, some as Yoli says, archaeological digs of self, right? Pulling out who you are, whose you are, and where you, the, the, the ideological beliefs you come from, the theories that inform your leadership, all of that is the self. And then the step two, I would say, you have to examine very critically of what's in your school. I'm talking about, I want you to read the handbooks, the policies, but I want you to read, not just any read. I want you to read like a conscious scholar, read for what's not there. What kind of language is, is used and not used? Look at your mission statement. And in my book of Unearthing Joy, I tell you how to read your mission statement. Is there any language around joy, identity development, justice, anti-racism, right? Look at school board policies. Take a few lessons or unit plans from any curriculum, social studies, ELA, do a little mini review and evaluation or audit of it. You know, use the CRE scorecard. That's a great tool. And then see how culturally responsive it is. Uh, is it just a, as a, is it just a curriculum that has a greater level of uh, representation of diverse people? Does it have people with different abilities and disabilities represented? Does it have black and brown people, linguistically diverse people, global people? Like look and see what's there. Because even if a curriculum is highly representative diverse of diverse topics and people, it doesn't mean it's culturally responsive if it's still just teaching and measuring skills. Mm -hmm. So you have to do an evaluation of those five areas I mentioned, of the standards, of the assessments, of the curriculum, um, of the evaluation, see what's missing. And then you have to learn the five, number three, step three, learn the five pursuits and then you have to create something to teach to children and go into a classroom to teach it. You know, there is no way any principal or assistant principal can lead teachers 
and they have not taught a lesson plan in years. It, 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 it's not going to work. And teachers are not going to fully trust you and see you as their partners instructionally. So try it. That's going to make you understand the model in many ways when you implement it. You cannot just listen to me. You cannot just read the book. You have to try it for yourself. See how it feels. Does it feel joyful? And then the next step is, of course, just teaching it to your teachers. You know, um, and by the way, folks, hit the share button, hit the retweet button, tag somebody, let them know we're still here. You know, you you the folks that are regulars on this platform, Doc, they they will know that you touched a nerve with me on two things. Okay. And, and 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 I want to I want to address them. I want you to address both of them. The first thing you mentioned, mission statement. Now, you weren't necessarily talking. You were talking about what needs to be there in terms of any reference to joy. When I walk into a school as a consultant, one of the first things I'm looking for is the mission statement. Because yeah. I want to gain a sense of who that school is and what they're about. And if I don't see one, and then when I begin to ask questions as to just asking random people, students and staff, what is the mission? And they don't know. Then I know when I tell them I'm in a missionless school, a school that is not about much. And, it, and, and it's just a place that exists. So here's my question to you beyond what you had just said about joy being one of the contents of the mission statement. What are your thoughts about a school where there is no mission, where we just open the doors and kids walk in and staff walk in? See, I would question, what is your purpose? You don't got no mission. You don't got no vision. What's your purpose? You're just doing things haphazardly and you have no connected focus. So when something sounds good, you'll go here. If something feels good today, you'll go in this direction. That's not a way to be and live. And, and, you know, some people have a mission statement. They never refer to it. They never use it. And it sounds so good and they don't even implement it. I mean, we did an analysis of schools mission statements and we saw global citizenship show up. One of the most widely used phrases in a mission statement. And I'm like, I don't feel anything global citizenship elevation in the curriculum. Right. So, you know, I would say that someone without that mission, uh, what is your what is the purpose? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And see, for, for me as a principal, there'll be no school until that mission is recited by every one of us every morning. There'll be no yeah. staff meeting. There'll be no nothing, no assembly. No, yeah. nothing. that mission has got to be an inherent part of what we do. And yeah. who we are. so and then the other thing you said that touched the nerve with me that people on here who know me would know that is when you mentioned lesson plans, because there's a national debate as to whether or not they're necessary. And let me just state my position. My position is that is that they are absolutely necessary and that administrators should be reading them on a, on a weekly basis. How how do you lead a school and you and, and you haven't monitored the planning? Yeah. of what goes on in the classrooms every day. So I'm 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 way off script. I just I just wanted to get your thoughts because yeah. because of your genius, right? What 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 are your thoughts on lesson planning? So, what let's just ask this question. Hmm. When it comes to people like in Florida and 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 folks that are trying to um, negatively indoctrinate and ban books, ban Ruby Bridges, ban Black History, Black Liberation. Where do you think they're going first? Are they going to the standards? Are they going to the assessments? Are they going to the school board policy? You know where they're going? Curriculum. See, they know that if you control the curriculum, you control the people and generations. They've been doing this for a long time. They are, they are going to the curriculum because if whatever you teach that is leading, that is going to grow the person older yeah. to, uh, to decide how they navigate in the sense of humanity. Yeah. So do we need lesson plans and curriculum? I just define curriculum more as a package set of materials. Curriculum is the world around us. Mm -hmm. Curriculum is the stories we teach and tell. Curriculum is the imprint, the legacy building. You know, curriculum, I don't, I don't trap curriculum in smallness. Curriculum is life. I walk down the street, I see curriculum. <laughs> I'm seeing ideas for teaching and learning. And so should, should we dismantle it? No, but what we should do is rethink 
who gets to bring the lesson plans, the unit plans and the curriculum in our school? Who gets to write the curriculum for our community? That's what we need to do. And I think the best people to write the lesson plans are the teachers. But you cannot expect teachers to write curriculum without giving them time to nurture and cultivate their genius. Genius is not 45 minutes. I, I am a scholar. I am genius. I need time for it to be fully unfolded. And so when we think about curriculum and lesson plans, yes, we need them. We just need them to look and feel different. And this is where I mean, I love curriculum is my artwork, is my superpower. I write lesson plans in my sleep. I mean, I write lessons on a weekly basis. And so if we want, and, and this is where I like to extend myself to other people, if you want to see what more advanced, elevated, historically grounded lesson plans can look and feel like in math, what does culturally responsiveness look in math and PE, that's where I come in as one partner to help. I can tell you what it looks and feel like. I can speak out a lesson plan off the cuff. I mean, this is this is what we need to be able to do. Get in a very normal state of mind of what um, more advanced, more excellent, genius-like lessons and unit plans can look like. Well, tell them how to reach you. Just Google me. I mean, I'm the only one who has the name Golnissar Muhammad or Goldie Muhammad in the world. I don't know if that's good or bad. But um, yeah, people send me messages like on Twitter, Instagram. Oh, right, you know, I'm at the university. Come study with me. If you're in Chicago, I'm at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And of course, all my contact information is online. Good stuff. You still good? Yeah, I'm good. Let's go. You know, chapter three, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm coming out of Cultivating Genius, folks. You can get it right on Amazon right now. Okay. I'm not, for those of you that don't have it, you probably all have it, right? But chapter three is entitled Toward the Pursuit of Identity. That's probably my favorite chapter in the entire book. There's a section in that chapter entitled Students Must See Themselves in the Learning. Yeah. This statement, is, as I said before, that's that's it. That's at my core it, of, 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 of my educational existence. I want you to uh, indulge me for a second. I want to I want to read a passage a little, little lengthy, but I want to read this audience uh, fam. Take a listen to this. This is um, this is coming from chapter three in Cultivating Genius. OK, Dr. Muhammad said, as an example from my own life, I didn't truly understand my identities as a Muslim or black girl until I was in college. I remember mm -hmm. telling other children in my fifth grade class about my imaginary Christmas gifts, which I didn't really have because I was too afraid to not fit into the mainstream culture. My teachers also did not find any space to teach about Islam or my Muslim identity, nor did we read texts written by black women authors. This is a challenge because our identities and our strong sense of self are a form of protection and refuge for our children. If mm -hmm. they don't know themselves, others will tell them who they are yeah. in ways that may not be positive or accurate. Yeah. With that said, you talked about it before because you got ahead of me. But why does why does identity matter? And, and why must students see themselves in the learning? And I think I'm putting more emphasis on that second part of the question since you talked about identity. Why must students see themselves in the learning? Um, I remember Beverly Tatum says, uh, who I love, my gosh. And she said once, when you take a picture, a group picture, Typically, people look for themselves first. Right. Mm -hmm. And I always say, when you walk into a room, you are looking for yourself. Now, you might look, you might go to these educational conferences and be one of few men. I mean, sometimes that happens in uh, education. Uh, sometimes I walk into a space, I'm always looking for Black people and Black women and Muslims first. Mm -hmm. Because I... If I see myself, I feel like I belong. Mm -hmm. I, I feel safer. I feel like, okay, there's somebody like me here. I've been in spaces where I didn't see myself and I felt a little nervous, anxiety. I didn't feel safe. So with identity, when you see yourself, it comes for our children with a sense of safety, peace, joy. And, and see, when you have that sense of wellness and identity, that is when you can live out your self, your fullest potential self. That's what Pharrell Williams said in the foreword. He says it is only then 
where you can live out your full potential for your professional and personal dreams. And, and if children don't see themselves in the curriculum and the instruction and don't see how this connects to their lives, they are not fully, it's going to be some constraint and they're not going to be open, but there's going to be a little constraint where they're not uh, getting all that they need. Yeah. So identity matters, as you said, when you know who you are, no one can tell you any different. Right. It comes with a sense of protection. It comes with a sense of, I can do anything. It, it comes with self-empowerment, self-determination. You don't get to set my pathway. I set it for myself. Right. And so identity is a beautiful thing because it allows you to put yourself in a situation to relate everything to your life. It allows you to have confidence. And then when you know who other people are, it allows you to have empathy and love for humanity. Yeah. You know, you, you are less inclined to hate, to harm them. It, you know, if you know about the lives of LGBT. Uh, LGBTQ people, if you know Muslims, if you know Palestinians, if you know people who are different than you, you are more inclined to love them and not hate or harm them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, with the, uh, the, the, the photograph analogy you use, I use the same one. I've been using it for years. And and I and I use this as here's the photo and here's all of you. And, and you're going to look for, you're more than likely going to look for yourself first or your homie, your homie that's in the room that you love and respect. You may look for them, but most likely you look for you. But I say your children, when they take the group photo, their photo typically looks something like this. And you got children in the classroom saying that they know they were present when the photo was taken, but you intentionally, or for whatever the reason, cut them out of the photo. And now why are they missing? And, and 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 that's always such an interesting conversation, Doc, because yeah. the, because the room falls silent. Yeah. Because yeah. because they know it has happened. Yeah, they know it, and they know that you know when you look at indigenous boarding schools in the nation, it was a form of genocide. They they were trying to make native brothers and sisters be, look and be more white, cut their hair, strip them of their names and identities. Give me a nickname. I, I, we're going to give you a Eurocentric name. We are still doing that in schools. It doesn't look the exact same, but we are asking children to check their identity at the door. We're at doing Christmas and Halloween at this school and that's it. At the door. All right. So I, I got, I got, I got one more for you. I got one more reading. Let me get rid of the comment here out of unearthing joy. And um, let me, let me set it up this way. This, this word equity, um, I don't know about you, but I, I think I could probably guess that or surmise that when I'm on these Zoom meetings before I go and present somewhere, it is it is becoming very common for a client to request that I not mention the word equity or anything that equity entails. You haven't experienced that? I experienced it on a regular, right? Particularly- Yeah, they yeah, say the community. words not to say. Yeah. Like, I don't think- you know, you know my work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, typically, you know, one or two responses, either we'll have a discussion on what it is and what it isn't, or I'll say, why don't you find another presenter? You know, one or the other. But right. I got to bring my authentic self sure. there, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm reading, I was reading something here where you have a section called Defining Equity. Oh, yes. And, and, and as you know, equity has a zillion different definitions. All right. It, it depends on who the person is that's articulating it. And when I read yours and reread it to prepare for today, I said this, this, this is this is powerful. It's all inclusive. Let me share this with the fam out here. Many approaches and programs in schools certainly do not offer students of color an opportunity for true or full equity. Equity has been misdefined as simply providing rigor or access to all. Hear me well, folks, but it is much more than that. Equity is teaching and learning that is centered on justice, liberation, truth and justice and is free of bias and favoritism. You cannot talk about true justice, liberation, truth and freedom without talking about anti-racism. Equity is not just about adding a multicultural book to the classroom library or providing access to something educationally good or sound. Doing that does not ensure that children will learn about their identities or histories, nor the liberation of themselves and others. Multicultural books can still be used to teach in incomplete and deficit ways. If a school has skills only curriculum and it reports only data, 
from skills only standardized assessment it isn't fully equitable and it goes on so it, it gives us a, you gave us a very compre comprehensive look at what equity is so here's my question and this is the final question and then we go to the rapid fire okay. there's, there's there's a leader out there that's listening to us right now and the leader is saying i, I i'm with you I, I'm, and they're talking to you. I've been following your work for years before you wrote Cultivating Genius. I knew you were there and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm with you. They said, but I work in a district and there's no way in the world that I can be what Kefele just read from your book. How do I navigate the nonsense so that I can ensure that each youngster has an equitable opportunity to be successful in the school where I'm a leader? Well, okay, the first part of that, I can't be this. Who can you be? And are you okay with being that person? Mm. You know, can you be harmful? Like harm is harm. Not doing equitable work is harmful. So if you can't be anti-harm, my thought, but it's okay for you to be harmful or neutral on harm. And neutrality on harm is harm. I'm just gonna leave that with y'all. Y'all know what's going on in the world. Yeah. Neutrality of harm is harm. So you feel okay with yourself, your parents, your grandparents, the ancestors would be okay with you being okay, being leading, being neutral for harm. So first I want to say for every leader, there are schools and spaces that will nurture your equitable leadership, your anti-racism, your justice, your joy. Uh, it is my hope and prayer that everyone is at a school where they can be that. If they can't be that, you have to then discover who are you? Are you going to bring that into the space? Are you going to be silent? Are you going to Try, you know, I listen a lot as a leader when I go into a new job or a new school. I listen first because I'm trying to see how people think and operate. What theories, what research, what have they read? I'm trying to, to learn them. And so I would suggest for you to learn the space and learn the history, talk to parents and say, well, you know, uh, a lot of people don't want equity because they have no knowledge of what it can be for children or they fear that children won't pass the test. I say, are they passing the test now? <laughs> you know, so you might have to know who you are and be that person to lead for equity and say, well, uh, equity is not just access. Let's have equity look, look in this way in our curriculum. Let's try it out. Let's bring in partners who can help educate what this is. Because as a leader who is new to this building, and I have worked with people who don't want it, the very first question I would say, this is giving harm to children. Why don't you want something that's so good for everybody? And I would try to understand a lot of people just don't want it because they don't know how to do it. And then I would say, well, I'm your partner. I work here too. Let me help you. Let me be the leader of this. But this is the supports I need to lead you and to educate you and everyone else. So a leader does not wait for or rely on their superintendent, their school board, they do the work and they do it in a very smart way. If people care about numbers, give them numbers, <laughs> give them numbers differently. If people care about results, show them results. As a first year teacher, I had all kinds of ideas and I never went into my principal's office with nothing in my hand. I said, if I write this down, my principal would take me more serious. Mm -hmm. And everything, I, every idea after every after school program, girls program, I had it written down in a form of a proposal and I gave it to my principal and I said, can I try this? Mm -hmm. And as an assistant principal or a principal who's coming into a school like you described, 
write down your proposal and try it and and give it to the school board give it to the principal the superintendent and say you know what i'm seeing that this is not working for black and brown children linguistically diverse children can i try it and let me come back with the data i know that in this district we are rich in data let me show you the data <laughs> so you have to be smart in that way and not waiting for relying on do the work that you were hired to do you were hired to be a leader, the essence of a leader is to create a space where one does not exist mm -hmm. and to allow people to see where it has been unseen and then to bring people to where they were not. That's the essence of a school or district leader. Yeah. Be it. Be it. I love it. I love it. Hey, let's let's go to these rapid fire questions. I got 20, uh, 20 questions for you. Oh, OK. Let me Give me, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> give me, give me, give me a, either a one word or one sentence. If you feel like you're getting ready to add a comma, you went too long, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just for that reminder, because you know I talk yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Some, some folks give me a whole nother presentation. <laughs> well, hold up, y'all. Me, that's is, not me. I like the rules. Is education on the right path for underserved children in America? Wait, hold on. Say it again. I, I was so focused on one word. I didn't no, listen. No, no, no. Is, is, is education on the right path for underserved children in America? Sometimes. Are you optimistic about the educational prospects for the masses of black and brown students in America? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Can true equity occur in America's schools for black and brown and other underserved students? Not if society or the system doesn't change. Does Dr. Goldie Muhammad's work contribute to the progress we desperately need? Inshallah. If you could do a reset on your life, would your line of work be different or the same? Um, whatever God wills. <laughs> now that's a different one. Same, same, <laughs> yeah. same. I love, it. I love it. Why do you continue to do this work? Our children, the joy of them. What fires you up within the work that you do? Islam. What do you love about the work you do? The genius of educators. What do you dislike about the work that you do? Uh dis disrupting uh not disrupting harm so oppression and hurt pain and harm for educators and children sorry that's no you good no no that's good what has been your greatest victory in this work to date uh every every uh writing lesson plans and curriculum what has been your greatest mistake in this work um Dang, that's a good question. Uh, sometimes I feel like I move too too fast because of the urgent nature of the work. But you know, I wish sometimes I could slow it slow down. What has been your greatest challenge in this work? Uh, lack of knowledge, fear, hate for Black people. Mm -hmm. Who inspires you in the work that you do? Oh, um, every every teacher I meet, every leader, you. Um, and I read all them folks yeah. in the acknowledgments, I, so I have a sense of it anyway. <laughs> yeah, Black women, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are you reading right now? Book, blog, tweet, anything? Um, I, I came back, to, so I finished Rest is Resistance because uh, I need to rest more. Um, and then um, I, I always come back and forth to Secrets of Divine Love. Hmm. What book would you recommend for our viewers this afternoon? Um, any any bell hooks, yeah. the poetry. Um, I, I read a lot of poetry to help understand what to do in education. <laughs> like what do you want to What do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet? I I would love to write a foundational curriculum. I I want to write a full curriculum or to be a part of a full curriculum writing team for the nation. I want to give freedom, freedom like 
curriculum to everyone. I don't want it in piecemealed. Wow, that's powerful. Are you satisfied with where you are professionally right now? Yeah, whatever, wherever I'm supposed to be is where I am. What, what could you say to a viewer out there who's watching right now who continues to face closed doors? I would say I love you and get your people, get your village, get your family to love on you and to lift you. And um, what could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? I would say rest and drink water. Mm. And last question. If Dr. Goldie Muhammad was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Comedic genius. <laughs> I tell that to my husband. He doesn't think I'm that funny, but I would hope it would be something related to joy, genius, justice, and joy, but mainly joy and smiles and laughter. Listen, if we need it. And so if I can leave people smiling or feeling good and lifted, that's 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 my goal in life. I love it. Hey y'all, hit me with them with those emojis. If 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 today's session benefited you, if it resonated with you, if it added value to your practice, if it's useful, if you if you just enjoyed it, you got joy out of it. You already started. I was seeing all the emojis coming, but uh now that I said it formally, hit us with those emojis if you enjoyed today's presentation while I get my emoji, my big Louisville slugger. You uh you hit it out the park, man. <laughs> you came to bat four times. So that's 16 runs, grand slam each time. Josh Gibson style of, of, of the of the homestead grades. I'm wearing, you know, I wore this shirt today. I yeah. wear Negro League jerseys, but Dallas, well, Texas Rangers won the World Series. So, and you know, they play in Dallas. So I said, let me wear a Dallas shirt, the Dallas Black Giants, Negro Leagues in the house. So um uh, some of the best ball players that ever lived came out of that league. So I see all the emojis, folks. They come and they come and I see them. I see them. I see them. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. This was a powerful session. Yes. Oh man, I couldn't put I couldn't put a lot of your comments up, man, because I'm I'm paying it. I'm locked in. I'm locked in. So y'all forgive me, but I read all the comments afterwards. Um, you said Google you. So anybody want to get in touch with with Dr. Muhammad? Just Google Dr. Goldie Muhammad, and it'll come up. Or go to go to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever. She's she she was easy for me to find to access, I should say. So just uh because some folks, you know, I gotta dig around and all that, but uh this was easy. So we appreciate you. Any 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 closing thoughts, Doc? No, I just want to give a shout out and praise to you, brother. Thank you for all that you do for our leaders, for our educators. See, when when we when our hearts get heavy and we feel like we are tired, we're in despair, it is like podcasts like this, it is leaders and brothers like you that makes us feel like we can keep going even when our joy is deflated uh, de de deflated a bit and and so i just want to honor you and and give thanks to you as well that's all i that's all i wanted to end with i appreciate you i appreciate you let me close out do me a favor stay there because i can highlight you off camera before you start okay. Resume your day. Hey, folks, appreciate you being here as always uh, for week 184. Appreciate you being here. You found it not robbery. So join me next week for week 85. We got an old friend coming next week. Uh, those of you who were with us in that first year back in 2020, you remember we had the young lady that kept all the notes and providing them for everybody after this session, Kim Wilson Daniel. Yeah. Well, she's going to be my guest. Okay. Week number 185 folks so come on and join me and let's welcome kim wilson daniel back to the ap and new principles academy she watches it but uh but she'll be on as a guest every saturday morning facebook live prince uh principal showing her at 10 o'clock followed by create and educate dr sheikah houston and tammy taylor at dr tammy taylor at 10 30 unlock the middle with josh tovar and dean packard mm -hmm. on sunday night at seven and then village leadership group with dr Roz gaskins and coach williams tuesdays and thursdays at six visit my um, website at principalcafele.com. Make sure that you subscribe to the AP and New Principles Academy YouTube channel and like and follow the AP and New Principles Academy Facebook page. I'll write, I have a commentary up tomorrow morning, not later than 10. Um, and then lastly, your diet, your exercise, and your COVID precautions. Rock that mask in the places where you need to. Make sure you're getting that exercise in. I'm gonna get. I, I'm not gonna work out today, but I'll be back in the gym tomorrow. Oh, and uh, and make sure y'all are eating right, man. I know it looks tempting sometimes, but just let it go. Let eat it go. right and drink that water. Other than that, y'all, thanks for being here. Have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. 
Have your best week yet. Peace. 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 Thumbs up. Cock that fist back. One, two, three. Bam. I'll see y'all next week, y'all. Y'all be safe and 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 and, and I'll see you then. <laughs>